Huh. How about folks? Let me just make a few comments and observations about chapter 10. So, turning then to my PowerPoint, there's the share function. Here we go. So, chapter 10 is about allowing someone to die. Mercy death and mercy kill. And let me start off with pointing out that our authors early in that chapter ask the question, how is one to live a good life? How to live well? Well, this is folks is otherwise known as eudaimonia. Uh, it's an important uh, concept in Aristotle, but you know, I must admit I'm a little puzzled as how our authors can mention that question without even alluding to Stoicism and Epicureanism, which were two of the most significant schools of thought in the ancient world, which specifically addressed the question of eudaimonia. Now, it probably mentions, bears mentioning that our authors refer to what they refer to as mercy death, is more commonly known as assisted suicide. Someone provides the dying person the means of death, but the dying person himself or herself uses it. And what they call mercy killing is more commonly known as euthanasia. Someone else performs the fatal action for the dying person. Now, so long as you use one term or another in a way that reflects that distinction, I will give you credit for doing so. On page 187, our authors state that since those living in the United States generally do not have the ability to face aging or death well. We have a serious problem that we must try to solve. Fair enough. But what is the cause of this problem? There is, I think, a solution in a classic work, which they alluded to in the previous chapter, but under the wrong name. In the Platonic dialogue, the Phaedo, Socrates' students are alarmed to find him in good spirits while he's awaiting his execution via hemlock. He explains to him that the whole point of doing philosophy is, is to prepare yourself to confront the most serious issues in life, particularly death, in advance. This is related to the notion of eudaimonia. How can you first come to accept your own mortality if you have not addressed the question? of what, it con what constitutes a life well lived in the first place. Now, on page 28, our authors refer to the notion of a divine plan. Uh, but the problem with that is that if you buy into substance metaphysics, aka Plato, or to a lesser extent, Aristotle, um, the notion that that is most real, that is most unchanging, well, unfortunately, that does tacitly imply predestination. And that's very problematical because if all our acts are predestined, how can we be held responsible? Wasn't my choice. Now, this passage, uh, our authors on page 199 refer to the case of an old man who decided to starve himself to death. There is precedent for that. In the Jain religion, that's called Mahasamadhi, and it is considered the most holy way to die. Now, let me also add that on page 191, 191 relies, I think, a bit too much on unsubstantiated anecdote to make its point. It's important to remember, folks, that. Um, in scholarship, anecdote is considered weak evidence. And though it can be used legitimately to raise a question or to illustrate a point already established, it is not considered evidence unto itself. Part of it is that that's a lesser example of another policy called hasty generalization. Yes, you have this experience, but did you understand or interpret that experience accurately? Is that particular experience representative or was it perhaps an anomaly? 
a legitimate question raised by the text that I think bears emphasis is that is whether so long as there is hospice care to address issues of pain and suffering at the end of life, is there really any justification for either assisted suicide or euthanasia? Folks, I got to work in at least one pop culture reference each time, I'm trying to keep up, you know. So the question of whether and when euthanasia might be appropriate is an important plot point in this movie. Million Dollar Baby. It was made by Clint Eastwood and co-stars Hilary Swank and Morgan Freeman. Um, it's about a, well, uh, spoiler alert, it's about a prize fighter who is, um, becomes a quadriplegic towards the end of the story. And the question is whether or not she should be uh, allowed to die. She has devoted her entire life to becoming a prize fighter, and now she has no control over her limbs. Now, it's also worth adding that since our textbook was written, California now allows assisted suicide. It used to be, it was mostly Oregon, but California is now covered as well. Let me add the one troubling aspect of age-related debility is how to deal with the possibility of dementia in old age. If by the time the condition has become, become apparent, one may well be deemed illegally incompetent to make that decision. Just as a prize fighter who suddenly becomes a quadriplegic may legitimately be understood if they want to experience uh, euthanasia, to be euthanized, what about a person well, like myself, who lives the life of the mind. I think one of the scariest things for me is the notion of becoming, um, getting dementia or Alzheimer's. Let me just address the final um, essay, the final reading assignment, Confronting Physician-Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia, My Father's Death. Now, the, I have a couple issues with this essay. The author largely revort, resorts to what we call argumentum ad passiones, otherwise known as argument to emotion. They also, again, appeal to argument from anecdote, both of which, although effective as rhetoric, are not really considered valid um, evidence in the terms of academic think writing. That said, let me drop on the share function. I am joined for this. We, we have another cameo appearance. I am joined for this announcement by my furry teacher's assistant, Lady Miss Percival Stripey. So what is the deal, Stripey? Oh, she thinks that I should point out at least something positive to say about the essay in front of my physician assisted suicide. So the author does however suggest some interesting criteria for considering either assisted suicide or euthanasia. First, that the patient is already in the process of dying from physical causes. Second, the patient has less than six months to live. If the patient is depressed, is it only to an extent which is justified by the circumstances? And is the patient able to express definite treatment preferences? So, turning back to my PowerPoint for one last slide, uh, let me point out that there's some interesting questions raised by these readings. What do you think? What are your views as to what constitutes a good life while lived? So long as there's a hospice care, do you think to address issues of pain and suffering at the end of life? What do you think? Is there still any real justification for either assisted suicide or euthanasia? Is it appropriate? 
to have the option being able to make an advanced directive for euthanasia in case of dementia. I think I forgot to mention that that uh, is now legal in the country of Belgium. What do you think? These chapters are your opportunity to frame your own personal code of ethics. I know I have mine. Even if it's inquit, I think Stripey has hers. She is a total hedonist. It's all about the kitty treats. Okay, not a very profound philosophy, but you know, she's a cat. You have to make allowance. Anyway, those are my thoughts for today on the second chapter. Let me know if these announcements are giving you any helpful insight and instruction or uh, even maybe once or twice some amusement. So, ciao for now.